about the bells, the bells of Christmas by Henry Longfellow. And it was during a terrible time in the Civil War. But the bells, uh, the words to that song, I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play. And wild and sweet, the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in despair, I bowed my head. There's no peace on earth, I said. For hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Then peal the bells more loud and clear. God's not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to man. Now there's a little more to that story that I'll share with you in just a little while. This year, the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia, will celebrate their 329th year. Now, Brother Darrell, what has that got to do about us? Well, it's one of the oldest colleges in the United States. During the Civil War, it was left laying in ruins and it continued to struggle for a while until the destruction came of part of the buildings, until the faculty, part of the faculty, and most of the students were drafted into the war. But for seven years, the old college president left his dwelling place and walked through the rubble to the college chapel. And from the upper belfry, a rope hung. And every day for seven years, he pulled that rope and the bell rang. Ding dong, ding dong. And he said that he wanted the people of Williamsburg to know that the college was still there every day for seven years. Rain, snow, sunshine, ice, bad weather. He made his way to the chapel belfry and rang the bell. And his faithfulness paid off because right after the war, the college was reopened. Now, those two little stories, and the one I'll continue a little later this morning, bring to focus the importance of the bells ringing at Christmas. I want us to go now in the Bible to a time when the northern kingdom of Israel had been laid waste and its people had been carried away into captivity. The southern kingdom of Judah with Jerusalem as its capital, was under attack, but not yet conquered. And to many of the people, it seemed that even God had deserted them. His back had been turned to them. It was a sad and depression, depressing atmosphere that the prophet Isaiah came to for. But Isaiah's faith and hope was not dimmed in the midst of battle, in the midst of his people being carried away into captivity. And God spoke through him in a prophecy that brings us this morning to what I want to talk about. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2 through 3. If you want to look on the board or follow in your Bibles, and, and there's other passages more than 2 and 3, but... This says the people who walked in darkness will see a great light. Now, the light's not shining yet, but 
will see a great light. For those who lived in the land of deep darkness, a light will shine. You will, in, you will enlarge the nation of Israel and its people will rejoice. They will rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest and like soldiers or warriors dividing the plunder after a, a victorious battle. And then in verse 6 and 7, around 700 years before Jesus came to the earth, Isaiah wrote this prophecy. For unto you a child is born, pardon me, a son is given. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passion, the passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. 700 years prior to Christ's birth, Isaiah said it will happen. A child shall be born unto you. Those words came when most Jews had lost all hope in the nation of Israel. Yet in their despair, God gives these words as if the bell was ringing out and we can almost hear the bells ringing out the Christmas message. Isaiah was ringing the bell of the coming Christ, of the coming Messiah. And it will ring a special message to those who are living in darkness. And I want to just quickly go through again what Isaiah said. The first thing he said, for unto a child, us a child is born, unto, a son, uh, unto us a son is given. Down the road, this is going to happen. A child is born, a son is given. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. A new baby is coming. Well, that's a long advertisement. A baby, somebody, lady becomes pregnant and they proclaim to the, mostly to the parents, most of the time, maybe to a close friend or loved one, hey, I'm going to have a baby. A new baby is coming. You mean you're going to have a baby? Isn't that wonderful? But it happens all the time. I mean, that's not anything unusual, is it? I mean, you know, have, how many of you have a friend or a loved one who's going to have a baby before long? I mean, I, uh, there's got to be somebody somewhere, you know. Maybe not. None of you know anybody's going to have a baby? Whew. That's very unusual. But it happens all the time. Then the proclamation, it's going to be a boy. Really? What are you going to name it after its daddy? Okay. But that's not anything unusual. Congratulations to the parents, we say. But Isaiah is saying it's going to happen. But we need to read on to get the news, to hear the bells ringing. Think for a moment about the word given. It has great implications here. 700 years before it happened, Isaiah said, God the Father, God the eternal God is going to give the world his son, his baby. That's exactly what John 3.16 says, for, unto, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He was given to us, not just to Joseph and Mary, not just to the people of that time, but he was given to the whole world for all times. Amen? He's so important, this baby. Acts 4 says, and no one else can salvation be found. You think he's not important? He is. Isaiah said, there's coming somebody down the pike, 700 years down the way, 
I'm going to, God's going to give you a son, the world, and in him will be found salvation. He's given to you. It doesn't cost you a thing for all the world to have a savior. The most important thing, in my opinion, at Christmas time is not, uh, even for Christians, is not to remember just that the angels came to the shepherds on the hillside watching their flocks by night. That's good, and we like to read about it and wonder about it. And suddenly the angel of God came, and a host of heavenly angels came, and that's good, but that's not the most important thing about our Christmas story. The most important thing is that bell that Isaiah rang, for unto you a child shall be given. The most important thing is not Joseph and Mary. The most important thing is not the wise men or the shepherds. The most important thing is what's lying in the manger. Jesus Christ, unto you this born this day, is what Luke said. Chapter 2, verse 11, unto you is born this day, on Christmas Day. The bells finally quit tolling for the deliverance of the Son of God, and then it began to toll the proclamation of the Son of God. It's given to you this day in the city of David, which is Christ the Lord. We're here Churches across the land should not come to church other than to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. At Christmas time, we have gifts that we give each other. And I receive gifts, and you've received gifts, and you've given gifts, and we all declare that it's better to give than to receive. I mean, I know there's exceptions. Some people just want it all regardless. But I enjoy giving, don't you? I, I really do. I enjoy giving. But God gave the best gift of all, his son. And this son, Isaiah proclaimed, and the bell rang out, he shall govern with peace. He is the prince of peace. Verse 7 says, of the increase of his government, and peace there shall be no end of Isaiah. The Roman Empire was enforcing a law of peace. Either you obeyed the law or you, put, you were done away with or imprisoned. If you disturbed, made the disturbance at all, boy, that's not the kind of peace I want because the government says I've got to do thus and thus and thus. I want to do it because God says thus and thus and thus. Don't you? Amen. And there's a proclamation that is made by Jesus Christ himself. My peace I give unto you. Ring that bell. Ring that bell of peace. It is given to us to have peace. In the Second World War, when London was being bombed nightly, a man was given the job to be the air raid warden. And when the, the air, raid, uh, air sirens went off or the raid bombs were going off and they would all head for shelter. And um, in this particular bomb shelter one night, two American soldiers had come in with their girlfriends to get away from the danger. And the room was crowded with people getting away from danger. And in the background, these two couples sat together. And they were singing just a song among themselves very quietly. They were singing. And the warden heard them, overheard them, and he called for silence in the room. And he said to the two couples, up here is a piano. Would you folks come up here and sing for us? One of the girls was a good pianist. 
the bombs were still going off and the two couples made their way to the front of the room and they found an old hymn book and opened it and found the old hymn standing on the promises of God. We know that song well, don't we? And in perfect harmony, that quartet began to sing. And once their voices were heard, they were heard to have beautiful harmony. And they sang the first verse and a hush fell over the crowd. They sang it with such deep feeling that the warden said, we knew that they believed every word that they sang. When they sang the second verse, standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt fail, by the living word I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. Someone in the crowd with a low husky voice said, praise the Lord, amen. In the last verse, tears were running down the face of all the people, including the pianist. And when they came to one of the verses, one of the boys beckoned for the crowd to join them. And with quiet, half-choked voices, they began to sing together. Then the warden said, let's bow our heads in prayer. And there was an Englishman telling the story there. And he said, I've never been in a church service where I felt so deeply the presence and the peace of God flowing. He said, we forgot about the bombs. We just felt the presence of a holy God in the midst of a troubled world. I'm saying to you this morning that Isaiah said, there shall be a governor that will give you peace in the midst of a crooked world. When the troubles of life in our lives, regardless of what it is, we can find peace of God in our hearts and our minds if we submit to his divine will. The third thing this morning, Isaiah said, that baby that I give to you, God has promised you, will be a wonderful counselor. Oh, what a great word. The Greek word here is just a word that we don't understand, but it's called paraclete. And it's translated, this counselor is an advocate or a comforter. It means counselor a lawyer, wonderful lawyer, counselor. It's commonly used to describe one who will help you regardless of what happens, who will defend you, who will advise you, and who will stand by your side in the trials of life. Amen. Look at verse 6 again. For unto you, uh, pardon me, for a son is given to you. And that son will be your lawyer to defend against all others who are trying to persecute you and prosecute you in a spiritual sense, which is mostly the devil. Well, we got to remember to be strong, be courageous. In this world we're living in, we were talking this morning about all the bad news that's flying out and the young people who are dying right and left. We don't know what's going to come down the pike, but I know this much. We have a wonderful counselor who is the Holy Spirit that will be by our side regardless of what we have. Seek his counsel today if you have not. You won't regret it. Dive into the word of God. Immerse yourself into the wisdom of God. Spend time in prayer, pouring out of, of your heart, your problems to God. The Holy Spirit is our counselor. Then not last, but not least, mighty God, everlasting Father. 
Man, could I go off on that. Mighty God, everlasting Father. Isaiah, ring that bell louder. Mighty God, everlasting Father. Jesus Christ is our mighty God, and he is our everlasting Father. One reason Jesus left the ivory palaces of heaven and came to live among men was to reveal to us that God not only is a God of power, but a God of love and tenderness. Mighty God, everlasting Father. The word mighty God just simply means he's all powerful. Everlasting Father simply means he's a God of love. A true father loves his children. Look around this room this morning. You can see that in action. If we piece together the picture that Jesus painted of God, we'd have a portrayal of a loving heavenly father, one who is power and might, who will never leave us. Regardless of how far we may stray from home, Amen? You look stunned this morning for some reason. Our God is our Father. And there's no, I, I remember, I was thinking this morning about the time when another schoolmate and I were having <clears throat> arguments. Pretty young, didn't know any better. And let me give you the favorite words. My daddy can beat your daddy. My daddy is bigger than your daddy. Well, I want to declare something to you this morning. My heavenly father is bigger than any father in the world or out of this world. He's a God who loves us, who wants to pull us up into his arms and wrap his arms around us and tell us how much he loves us. There's a story of a Persian monarch who loved his people that he was ruling very much. And to understand and know them better, he would disguise himself. Have you ever heard, saw the movie or the, the TV script, Unco Undercover Boss, anybody? You ought, to, you ought to look at that once in a while. It's kind of revealing. But this monarch would disguise himself and go out into the public and mingle with the people and to see how they lived. And he came upon a shop. We'll just say it was a cobbler shop, man who makes shoes. Not sure what kind of job it was, but he went into the shop and the man was sitting down to eat his lunch. And the man looked up and saw him coming into the shop and he said, would you like to share lunch with me? And the monarch said, I would be greatly pleased to do that. And they became fast friends, and day after day, the monarch would come back to his shop in disguise until the day came when the monarch couldn't hold himself back and it revealed to the cobbler who he really was. The cobbler became very frightful and very fearful and stepped back away from him, and, and he said, oh, my Lord, and the monarch sat down and said to him, I'm the same guy that came into the shop many days ago. I haven't changed. And the man said, I don't know, I didn't know who you were, or I would have dressed better. And the man said, I didn't need you to do that. I would have had better food somehow, but the monarch said, I didn't need you to do that. I enjoyed every meal we had together. And finally, the monarch said to him, now that you know who I am, I want to give you a gift. I want to give you something that's valuable to you. What would you like to have? And the old cobbler looked up at him with tears in his eyes. He said, the only gift I'd like to have from you, sir, is that you would come and eat with me once in a while. I want to sit down with you. We have an almighty God who is a heavenly father that wants to come and sit down with us 
we don't need to fear. He'll take us up in his arms. <clears throat> Do you remember the passage in Isaiah? I mean, pardon me, Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. I want you to see this. They will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel. How many of you know what the word might It may be on the board. I don't know. Emmanuel just simply means God with us. God with us. That's what the monarch was saying to the cobbler. I want to be with you. I want to, I want to love you. Now I want to go back to the first story I shared with you this morning of Henry Wadsworth's song, Longfellow's song. And hear the rest of the story. On Christmas Day, he listened to the bells of a, new, uh, a nearby church. He was so overwhelmed by the loss of his wife of two years earlier. His wife had burned to death in a fire. And he also was very badly burned in trying to rescue his wife. And then he got word in the midst of his trial that his son, who had gone off to war, had been wounded and was paralyzed. And that day, as he walked outside, he heard the church bells ringing and he wrote the song. But I want you to hear the words the closing verse again this morning, even though we sang it and I've already read it, to get a little better picture of what Henry Long, uh, Wadsworth Longfellow was going through as he wrote the words, then peal the bells more loud and deep. God's not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, when peace on earth, goodwill toward men. So the lesson of the Christmas bells this year is about coming to understand that though it may seem tough at times and may seem like hope is gone, may seem like things are impossible, we still have hope because God is not dead. The bells that Isaiah proclaimed 700 years before Christ came are still ringing. They're always ringing, just waiting for us to pause in life and listen to them. And those bells have hope and peace and joy that we find at Christmas. Amen. Let's stand together. Thank you, Father, for the story of the bells that Longfellow wrote. It brought such great comfort to us to know that God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. He understands everything that we go through. He knows where we are. He knows each and every one of us. Get honor and glory today out of this little message, Lord. May we go this week rejoicing and praising you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.